Episode 14, August 23rd, 1914, Long Lines of Death, by Corporal John Lucy, read by John Goodman. The author of this magnificent description of his experiences at Mons, who with his brother ran away from home and enlisted in the Royal Irish Rifles in 1912, was a corporal in 1914. He rose to the rank of sergeant and was commissioned second lieutenant in 1917, retiring as a captain. He was invalid at home with multiple wounds during the Second Battle of Ypres. He wrote a famous war book, There's a Devil in the Drum. A staff officer came perspiring from behind and overtook us. He trotted past in a hurry, asking for the commanding officer. A hundred voices answered him, At the head of the column, sir, and eight hundred pairs of eyes viewed him with that feeling of amusement peculiar to a mass of men finding entertainment in the efforts of an isolated individual. The soldiers criticised his accent, his face, his seat, and his mount in turn, and then they cursed him because of the result of his coming. This was the order to turn about, or go back on the road they had come, to the trenches abandoned that morning. So about we went, and passed him back to the rear of the line of trenches, took to the open country in artillery formation, and thus extended went forward to occupy the earthworks. The old army was familiar with the sitting and digging of trenches, although it was typically generally trained for open warfare. The type of trench here was called a kneeling trench, and it was roughly only three feet deep, this being considered good enough for temporary occupation by infantry not expected to remain in it for the entire course of the battle. Our motto was attack or counter-attack, and we had very little time for entrenchments, which though they might be useful during a short period of temporary defence, were generally despised. With many jokes, the men settled into their defences and cheerfully waited for the enemy presenting in his direction a line of first-class riflemen, each trained to fire 15 well-applied shots a minute. Our two machine guns poked their squat muzzles in support from their emplacements. A battery of field guns wheeled away from the main road and drew up on the back slope of our position about 300 yards to the rear. The menacing mounts of the 18-pounders slewed around in our direction and remained while the horses were led rapidly away under cover. The activities of the smart-looking gunner slowed down, and the teams began still behind their gun shields. A young subaltern came forward to our height as observation officer. All them was ready, as far as we were concerned, for the Battle of Mon. At half past three in the afternoon, as nearly as I remember, the Germans discovered before us we saw them, and three or four dull thuds to our distant front, followed by a wearing noise rapidly approaching us, marked the discharge of enemy guns and our first moment under shell fire. The salvo of shells passed over our heads and burst about 80 yards in the rear with a terrific clattering crash. We were highly interested. More came and still more, all going over. The heads of our curious men appeared above the trenches, looking back to see the bursts. Look, they shouted, a black one, or only one, or four more whites. Some laughingly imagined themselves on butt duty on the rifle ranges at home and shouted advice to the German gunners. Wash out! Another miss, and lower your sights. One wag simulating great terror cried, Send for the police, there's going to be a row on here. And another in mock despair, Oh mother, why did I desert you? Then the enemy gunners shortened and the shells exploded above our trenches, and the men, already taken in hand for exposing themselves, crouched low. I had been standing about by my ammunition carts on the open road, immediately behind and parallel to our trenches, and not far from the commanding officer, who was, with his adjutant, fully exposed on a little rise nearer to the entrenched companies, when fragments of a bursting shell ripped and slashed all around us. Someone shouted, take cover, and my men and I, leaving the carts to the drivers, took shelter as best we could in the roadside ditch, amateurishly choosing the side of the road furthest from the enemy. The Germans now ranged well, and their shell fire seemed to concentrate heavily on the trenches. The acrid smoke of the explosions blew about us and screaming pieces of metal and shrapnel balls flew in all directions. One shrapnel bullet hit my pack, and I instinctively moved a little further along the ditch to a burly sergeant who laughed at me when I handed him the still hot ball for his inspection. I was too young to discern nervousness in the laugh. A dispatch rider coming towards us on the road from the west fell off his motorcycle when a shell burst over him. His antics distracted and amused us. The shell fire became hotter and hotter, and we crouched further down in our ditch. The commanding officer still remained exposed to all fire, and his adjutant kept taking messages to the entrenched companies. Two stout fellows, 
Finally, the shelling ceased and we put up our heads to breathe more freely. Then we heard conch-like sounds, strange bugle calls. The German infantry which had approached during the shelling was in sight and was about to attack us. Not a shot had been fired from our trenches up to now. The only opposition to the Germans had been made by our field gun battery, which was heavily engaged behind us and making almost as much clamour as the enemy shelling. To my mind it seemed that the whole battalion must have been wiped out by that dreadful rain of shells, but apparently not. In answer to the German bugles or trumpets came the cheerful sound of our officers' whistles and the riflemen, casting aside the amazement of their strange trial, sprang to action. A great roar of musketry rent the air, varying slightly intensity from minute to minute, as whole companies ceased fire and opened again. The satisfactory sharp blasts of the directing whistles showed that our machinery of defence was working like the drill book, and that the recent shelling had caused no disorganisation. The clatter of our machine guns added to the din. For us, the battle took the form of well-ordered, rapid rifle fire at close range, as the field grey human targets appeared or were struck down. The enemy infantry advanced, according to one of our men, in columns of masses, which withered away under the galling fire of the well-trained and coolly led Irishmen. The leading Germans fired standing from the hip as they came on, but their scattered fire was ineffected and ignored. They crumpled up, moan down as quickly as they tell it, their reinforcing waves and sections coming on bravely and steadily to fall over as they reached the front line of the slain and wounded. Behind the death line, ticker converging columns were being blown about by our field guns. Our rapid fire was appalling even to us, and the worst marksman could not miss, as he only had to fire into the brown of the masses of the unfortunate enemy, who on the fronts of two of our companies were continually and uselessly reinforced at short range, of 300 yards. Such tactics amazed us, and after the first shock of seeing men slowly and helplessly falling down as they were hit, gave us a great sense of power and pleasure. It was all so easy. The German survivors began to go back here and there from the line. The attack had been another failure. Soon all that remained was the long line of the dead heat before us, motionless except for the limb movements of some of the wounded. Every battle seems endless that I was taking part in it, all sense of time is lost and the minutes appear to be hours. The sequence of events is lost and the most unlikely tales are told by survivors. I am hazy as to what happened after the first great attack. I believe the Germans tried to come on again, but I am not sure. At any rate, they did not succeed. We were not without casualties, but for such a terrific lot of shooting, there were very few indeed and were actually the least we had in any battle of the war. Only three or four men were killed and the same number wounded. Most of the German shrapnel shells had burst too high and their rifle fire was hopeless. A German shell burst on one of our machine gunners, killing him instantly. His place was immediately taken at the gun by a lance corporal who was shot almost at once through the arm. He, though wounded, continued to fire his guns, but he rather puzzles those near to him by weeping at intervals, either with pain or fright. He would not, however, leave the gun until his arm stiffened. One seldom hears a soldier crying or raising his voice in any way, for that matter, when wounded. A shot through joints like the knee or through the stomach often makes a man shout out in great pain, but most wounds are merely numbing for the time. Most of the pain comes afterwards, when the wounds are being dressed in hospital. Our commanding officer still stood on the high ground overlooking the scene of action. He now had fears for our ammunition supply. I had doled out a large number of boxes and an officer presently came along and ordered all of my carts away to be refilled. The sounds of the battle had died down and all was quiet except for some intermittent shelling from the Germans. I was to take my carts off to a refilling point controlled by the artillery a mile or so away to the southeast. It was getting dark and the lights of the enemy campfires could be seen in the distance. Nearer the Red Cross lanterns appeared here and there on our front, showing that they were attending to their wounded. A mounted bombardier came to guide my carts, and off we went, passing along a road that appeared to me at any times to traverse no man's land, for we passed British infantry facing north on our right hand. They greeted us and joked at us from our trenches. We had orders to hurry, and in the rush of our departure no check was made of the total amount of ammunition still in hand. In order to travel lightly, we had also been told to leave our packs behind us in the ditch. Having gone some distance in the darkness, I noticed that three or four carts gave forth the heavy rumble of well-weighted vehicles, and I called a halt to examine them. 
I found three almost full and completing them from the fort, I took matters into my own hands and brought them back at once to the battalion, terrified least it should be without a reserve of ammunition in case of another enemy attack. The fort cart I ordered on to the refilling point with two of my men and the bombardier. It was after midnight when I rejoined the battalion and reported my action. The officer who had sent me merely said, good, now go and rejoin the machine gun section. I found the section fallen in on the road behind the trenches and saw that our companies were also evacuating their positions. All was very still and peaceful. Quiet words of command were passed along, number, form fours, right, keep silence, quick march, and off we went stealthily in columns of fours from the battlefield of Mons. In the morning, the entire British army was marching south in retreat.